Philippians 2, 14 to 16, sanctification, so little means so much. Last time we looked at verse chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Let's read that again, our last week passage. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So the motive for why we're walking in obedience. And then he says a, a rather interesting phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some people read that very quickly. Oh, work, work for your salvation right there. No, no, no. He's saying in the state of being saved, you need to have this sense of awe of God, this reverence to honor God and not to dishonor God. And a real sense, we're in the world, we're in sinful flesh with a complete free will. Like Adam and Eve in the garden, we can obey God or disobey God. And, um, and then in verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So we, we looked at the difference between justification and sanctification. And as you read through the Bible, interesting enough, the word saved is most of the time referring to sanctification, not justification. And so many get so many ideas of, of having to wonder if they're going to lose their salvation or they're not working hard enough to keep their salvation because they're looking at verses they've been told are concerning justification. And justification, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you know those verses well. It, it couldn't be clear. It's not of works. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Nobody can ever make it to heaven by what they do. It's by God what he did. Salvation comes through the cross, what Jesus did, and having faith in his work, period, apart from works. But sanctification is living holy, to be sanctified, set apart. It, the, the priest had uh, their shovels and, and different instruments that were sanctified. They were set apart, only used for God. That's what he's saying, that while we're in this body, that we would be holy vessel, sanctified only for God's use. And, and, and that, yes, it's, it's really on you. The Lord says, I'll, I'll, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So the, the first step in sanctification is you living the sanctified life. And then God with his power will come in to give you the ability to will and to do. Without God, we can't, but without you, he won't. And, and so free will is really free will. It, it's not some mystical thing where God, you know, funnels it through his sovereignty and, and all of this. No, it's just that simple. If you pray, God can answer a prayer. If you don't pray, guess what? God can't answer a prayer. You didn't pray. If you meditate in the word, God can speak to you. If you don't meditate in the word, guess what? <laughs> so this, it comes back to just a very real practical thing, but this does not earn our salvation. This doesn't guarantee our salvation. This doesn't, you know, put the period on the end of the sentence. It does nothing for, for salvation. Justification is done as a gift of God, like the thief on the cross, hands tied, feet tied. His justification, 100%, was done by the work of Christ. He's in heaven right now because it's a gift. One of us, all of us in heaven in the same way are gonna to go to heaven as a gift of God, not of anything we say or do in the past, present, or the future. But we gotta realize that this is just a daily thing. Paul said to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, hey, in God's house, there's vessels of gold and silver, and then there's vessels of wood and clay. Some, honor, some vessels are for honor, other vessels are for dishonor. And then he makes it plain to Timothy that you need to be sanctified vessel, the one of gold and silver set aside for the Lord's use. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, hey, Jesus Christ is the foundation, and no other foundation can anybody lay other than him. But it's you building on that house with the bricks. 
And if you're building with bricks that are, again, gold and silver and precious stones, or hay, wood, and stubble, all our works on the day of judgment before the Bema seat of Christ, not before the white throne judgment of the unrighteous, but we are going before the Bema seat, which is the reward seat. He said, if your works are gold and silver and precious metal, they, they're truly that, that life sanctified and, and through God's power, you're doing these good works. You're going to have a great reward in heaven. But he goes, there, there's going to be some Christians that their entire Christian existence has never had one brick that was truly set aside living in sanctification for the Lord. And they'll be saved, but they'll have no rewards in heaven. So we have to daily choose to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Meditate in his word, Psalm 1 says, and you'll prosper in all that you do. Pray without ceasing, but if you ask not, you receive not, as James tells us. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all this earth stuff will be added to you. If not, it won't. It's just a very simple formula. Free will is really free will. It's that simple. And in, in every generation, there's always been a group of people that, that have to fill it before they do it. But in this newest, youngest generation, it's all fillings. It's like, I can't do anything until I fill it. And once I fill it, then I can imagine doing it. Well, guys, our body is sold under sin and to bondage. As Christians, we don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. God said, seek him first. I'm not waiting for a filling. I'm just going to seek him first. First of every day. We're here the first of every week. We're giving God the first morning of each week. And we just do it by faith. And Paul tells us that we've got to beat our body into subjection. We've got to crucify our flesh with its passions and desires. And so an interesting note to the Thessalonian church. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you walk in sanctification, that you figure out your vessel and how to keep it in sanctification and honor. And boy, we feel the weight of it, don't we? Ah, Lord, help me. I I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I... My spirit's willing, but my flesh is weak. But that's chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians 4. But then 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely in spirit, soul, and the big one we worry about, body. He who called you is faithful. And here's a verse in the Bible, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And he shall do it. In that verse, it's saying, may the God of peace himself, it's emphatic, with no one else's aid, without anybody else's input. So we learn, and, and we covered this in Hebrews 10, 14, that through the one sacrifice, he has justified all of us who are now in the process of being sanctified. So 1 Corinthians 1 says, nobody should glory in the flesh because Christ became for us. He says justification, but he also says sanctification. Guys, we're all going to be 100% sanctified. As soon as we die and we go to be with the Lord or the rapture comes, we're going to be spirit, soul, and our new heavenly body, but a body 100% sanctified. Oh, I can't wait for that day. Our flesh wants to serve the Lord. Our world that will be in that heavenly world will want to serve the Lord. No devil, no evil thoughts, no evil people, everybody pure of heart because God did it by his power. But right now, you and I, while we live on this earth, we have that little tiny line between the day we are born and the day we die. (laughs) 
And life is just that thing, isn't it? A little vapor. Our life is just a little short thing. David said, Lord, help me to know the number of my days that I might gain wisdom. Soon as we leave this body, guys, we'll never have to deny ourselves again. We'll never have to fight temptation again. There will be in a body as no pain, no sorrow. We can never serve anybody again. Isn't that amazing? We'll never be able to give monetarily. We won't be able to give of our time. We'll never have to sacrifice or have the opportunity to sacrifice. The only time we have to gain rewards in heaven is this little slash. And so let's say for a hundred years you follow the Lord and sacrifice, you end up in prison like Paul and so many believers in China and Russia and now in Iran and India. You know what? When we come, the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation period. He's here for a thousand years. We are here with him. So you give up a hundred years and God gives you a thousand years. Isn't that God? I think him just saying, yeah, you, you know, Peter said, Lord, we've forgiven, every, you know, we've lost everything. We've sacrificed even our families and we've left our jobs. We, we, we are now all, you know, barely making it because we chose to follow you. And Jesus said, and you'll receive a hundred times more in the life to come. And he gives the whole big list that, that Peter gave him. Yeah, we're going to come back. Well, I was serving the Lord and I, you know, tithed and I didn't have money. I wanted to go to Australia. Well, go live there for 100 years and you got 900 years left. Well, I, I wanted to climb the Alps, but my, you know, time I could afford it and go, I was too old and my knee didn't work anymore. Go climb the Alps for 100 years. Do you see, even when we try to lose our life in this world, God gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So we really can't outgive God, even in this area of sanctification. And so God is doing it. So we understand that when we say, okay, I know the mind of God, I know the heart of God, I know the will of God because we study the scripture. So let me give you an example. The Bible says to forgive those who have wronged me, right? It says, pray for them, do good to them, bless them, love them. So you can be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So somebody has wronged me and I want to forgive them, but I can't. I, this time around, there's a love that I do not know about. There's a heart of forgiveness that I've never experienced. But I look at the word and I say, God, you told me to pray for them. All I can pray for them is that you would kill them. You said pray that they would be blessed to overcome evil with good works, good deeds. So now I come and I take this step. By faith, Lord, I'm going to love them and forgive them. By faith, God will empower you. And the moment you step out of the boat to try to walk on the water, the Lord will be there and give you a new work of the Holy Spirit. So God allowing trials to come in our life is a way for us to see our need for greater sanctification and a greater need to walk by faith, right? So we're out in the middle of the lake on a calm day and we think we're gonna drown and the Lord saves us and then we're out in a little bigger of a storm and then finally we're in a giant storm and we're ready to sink and we have faith. Hey God, you're you're in control. You got it worked out. So that's a little bit of an introduction on sanctification, but we come today to verse 14 to 16. Philippians 2, verse 14 to 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Verse 15. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. 
So Paul starts out here and he said, do all things without complaining. The old King James says murmuring. I, I think we know what that is, right? We've read this story when they come out of Egypt and they all are murmuring. And then also disputing. The actual word here in the Greek translated complaining or murmuring is gogosmos. Sounds like complaining, doesn't it? Gogosmos. Gogosmos. Murmuring. Oh, you can, just by the sound of it, you can hear there's this complaining spirit going on. It, the word disputing literally means to be debating within your own soul. And you're complaining and nobody's around and finally you mutter and somebody hears it and they're like, hey, I think the same thing. I'm going to do a, a Weiss quote here in the Weiss Word Studies. He says this. It refers not to the loud unspoken dissatisfaction, but to that undertone murmuring which one sometimes hears in the lobbies of our present day churches where certain cliques are having it out, so to speak, amongst themselves. The, the word refers to the act of murmuring against men, not God. The use of the word shows that the division among the Philip. The Philippians had not yet risen to the point of loud dissension. The word is found in the secular documents reporting an interview with Marcus Aurelius and a rebel. A veteran presented interposes with the remark, Lord, while you're sitting in judgment, the Romans are murmuring. So it hasn't come to an out loud thing where it's affected everybody in disputing. But this murmuring in your heart and then this disputing in a small clique it slowly begins to rise and to completely pollute everyone. And of course, when we think of the word murmuring, we think of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And what happened to those guys? Their complaining eventually caused them to die in the wilderness. Their complaining eventually affected everybody. The cancer, it just began to grow and grow. And what does that cancer want? It wants to permeate every cell in the body. The murmuring is clearly the opposite of faith. The heart of faith sounds like a little child in their trust. God has it all in control. God has a plan for everything. God can turn even this around for good. There's just that childlike, simplistic faith like Joshua and Caleb had. The, the ten spice came back going, they're giants. And they looked at us like grasshoppers and we felt like grasshoppers. And we're going to die and they're going to rape our wives and they're going to kill us. And they're going to take all our children as slaves. And, uh, uh. and Joshua and Caleb said, it doesn't matter how big people are. We're talking about God's fighting for us. God, God's going to eat them like bread and butter. We, we've got it, guys. We're going to easily win this. When they were talking about their faith, what happened to the crowd? Let's kill those guys. We, they're annoying us. Yes. They did not like the people of faith. That Jesus said, unless you have that heart of a child, God's going to do it. God's got it in control. God's going to turn it around for good. You know, is one of the things in the Jesus movement. There was just such a childlike faith. Hey, my car's not working. Praise the Lord, because I, I think he has some people for me to witness to on the bus. <laughs> they just never missed a minute. Man, I got hit by a car, and I'm going to be in the hospital for a few weeks. Man, this is all awesome, because I know there's so many doctors and nurses that need Christ. There's just this simplicity of faith that, again, seems simple-minded. And it's rather annoying and irritating to the more intellectuals amongst us. But notice he says, in all things, all things, without murmuring and complaining. So it comes back. Can you believe God is involved in trivial little things? Or is God only thinking about the big things? God's, you know, yeah, we can pray about, you know, the big things that affect the whole world. But can I pray about this little hangnail I got last night that's hurting me? 
Can the little child pray their little prayers about the little tiny things that affect their life? Or do we just sort of scoff at that because it's so inconsequential? Why would God get involved with that? No, all things. All things. God's involved in all things. So here's some questions to ask yourself. Do you really believe God is in charge of all things, no matter how big or how small? Like each hair on your head or every sparrow that falls to the ground in the middle of nowhere? Remember in Luke 12, Jesus said that. God knows every hair on your head. God, you, you, you have little sparrows that are, that are less than a penny. You can buy five of them, but yet God knows about one of them that falls to the ground, not noticed by anybody else, but God notices that. And he ends that section by saying, just fear not, little lambs. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Secondly, do you believe as a Christian that God really loves you? And he has you in his hand. Remember Romans 8.31, it says, What shall we say to you, these things, God? Is God is for us, who can be against us? He goes on in Romans 8 to say, I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present to come, height or depth nor anything created shall separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Do you really believe that God loves you and he's interested in every tiny little thing in your life? He goes on to finish in in Romans 8, 37 saying, we are more than conquerors because of that love. David had to come to to learn, even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, we go through that valley more than once in our life too, don't we? I'll fear no evil, because God's with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When I read that now, I often think of Paul and, and Silas in the prison in Philippi, after they've been beaten with rods and and horribly mistreated. They're in chains down in the damp, damp dungeon. And what do they start doing? They start singing and praising the Lord. No complaining there. Man, I come all the way here and I preach the gospel and this is what you let it happen to me, God. I thought you loved me, God. Why did you let that one guy, I mean, I got hit in the body, that was one thing, but that headshot, God, don't you care? Now here I am, this place stinks and there's rats and I'm cold and, and I'm hanging on this thing, it's miserable. What do you, you know? Now, they were, they were just, like the disciples earlier, just thanking God they were worthy to suffer for the gospel's sake. Thank you, Lord. Psalm 121, it says, oh, I lift up my eyes to the hills, referring to Jerusalem, to where the, the presence of God was in the Old Testament. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will never slumber. He who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. In the Hebrew, that's like personal bodyguard. The Lord is your a shade on your right hand. The sun shall be, not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He'll preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, even forever. Here's another question. Are you living in a way that you are growing so that your faith is getting strengthened? Remember Jude says, building up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit. And then next thing, keeping yourself in the love of God, looking towards the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. David says, I hid God's word in my heart that I wouldn't sin against him. Paul, and a couple of chapters later, in, in chapter 4, 4, is going to finally just say, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, because he had been saying it all through the book of Philippians. I'll say it again. I know I've already said this a few times, but I'll, I'll say it again. So what really is sort of the opposite of murmuring? Isn't it faith? It is. But it's also rejoicing. I actually have that printed in just a minute. You got ahead of me, Chris. Yeah, the opposite of murmuring is faith. But in this case, I was just saying the opposite of not complaining is rejoicing. 
Paul tells Philippians in 1 Thessalonians 5 to rejoice the Lord always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. I, I think of Jesus, a man who never sinned, but yet he's dying on the cross between two criminals, thieves. At least they could have been popular, you know? Like, you know, guys who blew up a building for, blew up a bunch of Romans for, for Israel. Yeah, you know, a couple of insurrectionists on each side. Not just two common criminals that were incorrigible. They decided if I had to crucify him. So Jesus looks like a criminal. I know that guy's guilty. I know that guy's guilty. So the guy in the middle must be a criminal too. I just don't know about him. Well, not that many people knew about the other two guys either. They're just three criminals getting crucified. They all deserve it. Jesus never sinned, but yet he took the sin of the whole world upon him. So in, in essence, I'm just trying to say, if there was ever anybody on earth who had the right to complain. It was Jesus on the cross, right? <laughs> and it tells us in Hebrews 12, get your eyes on Jesus because it tells us there that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame Let's get our eyes on Jesus and, and look at the time when he had the right to be a murmurer, to be a complainer. You hear all his words were very positive. John, take care of my mom. And of course, those amazing words. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus wasn't being overcome with evil. Even on the cross, he was overcoming evil with good. And then a, some of the kindest words anybody could ever speak to the thief. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. You see, I really hate people saying to be positive because it'll help you make more sales or get richer. But I, I love when we are rejoicing in the Lord because we have faith that God has a plan no matter how insignificant it is, right? I mean, when I bump my toe on a chair, the fact is sometimes it's just because things like that happen, right? Adam and Eve sinned and toes get bumped on chairs. But I always pretend that it's God getting a hold of my attention because probably 90% of the time it is. Brian? I have something to say to you and sit down and listen. Ah, my toe. Okay, I'm sitting, I'm sitting. And you know what? When I come with that heart of faith, I do. I hear from God. The other thing I like to do when I go through bad things is I like to blame the devil for everything. Why not? Whether he's guilty or not, it's just a good thing to blame the guy. But when I'm complaining about Satan and his demonic world, that's okay. But I need to fix my eyes on the Lord and rejoice in the Lord always and everything give thanks for this is the will of God. This is the will of God concerning you. Now, hang on a minute. I, I know we had that little tiny simple verse, but it ties right into verse 15. That you may become blameless, harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Did, did you catch that? He said, if you are a person rejoicing in the Lord and seeing everything as God's got it in control and God's got a reason for everything and, and you find yourself keeping your eyes on that author and finisher of your faith and whatever you go through, you're rejoicing in it. You know what happens? You wouldn't think a big things happen with that. But it is. We appear to the world blameless. Do you understand what that means perfect? They cannot find one 
something wrong. Remember Daniel? Daniel was like that. They tried to find an accusation against Daniel. He lived in Babylon for 80 years. Surely there's something. The only thing they could get on him is that he prayed three times a day with his window open facing Jerusalem. Gee, that was it. His prayer life. (laughs) He prayed more than he probably should. This is what he's saying. If we are not murmuring, complaining, disputing like the rest of the congregation of the world, we to the world are going to appear blameless, harmless, like the children of God without fault and shine as lights to the world by that one thing. Now, you see, I, I thought to be sanctified, you know, the people to really be affected by me It starts with praying 10 hours a day. You got to get up at three in the morning every day and you got to pray till noon. And and then you got to read the Bible at least three hours a day. And you basically just never have a lustful thought. You never have an angry thought. You just are just like that all the time perfectly. And then you appear as light, you know, sort of like the, the monks in the monastery. You know, go live in a cave somewhere and, and I'll be this holy, righteous, sanctified person. So they put on these scratchy clothes. They shave their head. They don't eat anything that tastes good. And they live in this monastery and they don't talk. And man, am I holy. Look at me. I've cut off all possibilities of flesh and I'm now this spiritual powerhouse through my body because I'm living this monastic life. You guys guys heard about that that one guy who went to the monastery like that. And they told him, you can't talk. But every 10 years, you can say two words. So the guy, after the first 10 years, says, bed hard. Okay, going back. 10 years later, he says, food bad comes back 10 years later and he says, I quit. (laughs) And the Monsignor said, I'm not surprised. You've continually complained for 30 years. (laughs) All you've done is complain for 30 years. So coming back to this, we are a powerhouse. We are light to the world when we're not complaining. We're not murmuring. When we're not grumbling to other people, we appear as lights to the world, blameless, harmless, without fault. Can you imagine that? Such a little thing produces so very, very much. And then he says, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. Now, your your first thought is to say, yep, that's the world. The world out there is full of perversion and they're crooked. They're evil people. But interesting enough, now that Paul's got us on this murmuring word, we're thinking about Israel. And sure enough, Paul's actually quoting a song of Moses, not about Egypt or about the world, evil world around him. He's talking about the children of Israel. And in Deuteronomy 32.5 they have corrupted themselves. They, have not, they are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Paul, Moses in this song, you can read it there in chapter 32. He's saying, God, you've been nothing but wonderful. God, you, you, you set us up. You, you did so much. I mean, you think about all that God did for them. He took them out of Egypt with the mighty hand with all the gold and all the wealth of Egypt with them. You remember that? They, they, God said, go to the doors of these Egyptians. They gave them all their wealth. And then God says, now how can I bless them? What shall we give them to eat? Let's give them food right from heaven. Well, how shall we comfort them? You know, it's dark in that desert. Let's give them this nice night light. <laughs> in the nighttime, we'll give them a fire that they can all see fine. Then it gets hot in the desert. Let's give them a cloud by day. And when they get thirsty, I'm going to give them right the supernatural water from a rock. 
I mean, God, God had blessed them so much. But yet, that stinking, man, I'm tired of it. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. And they were nothing but irritated with God continually. Always ready to kill Moses and Aaron because God starts to test their faith even a little bit. So he's not saying the world. He's saying the Christians that are complainers as well. We're in the midst of a generation. Some of them are in the church. A lot of them are on the outside of the church. But I'm going to separate you, not by whether you're saved or not saved in this instant. I'm going to separate those who complain about God and his provisions and who he is and his plan, that he has all things in control and there's not a hair that falls from your head that he doesn't know about. And so how do you think he allowed this difficulty in your life unless he's allowing it for whatever reason? And yes, a lot of it is just fallout from Adam and Eve's sin. It's just, just reality. You know, I think a lot of people are going to give Adam a quick kick in the, in the rear when we get to heaven. But the, the, the fact is, is that he's saying you're in the midst and some of that midst is in the church. Who are not just saying, God, you're so good and you've got everything in control and I trust in you no matter what. And, and naked I came in this world, naked I go out. And, and there's a time and a season, there's a time to live, there's a time to die, there's a time of peace, there's a time of war. It doesn't matter. You make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, I, I trust in you that you're, you're at work. No matter how minute the detail, you have it in control. And he's saying to us who are believers, if we can trust in the Lord and not murmur and complain, we will appear as lights, plural, in the world. The word there is literally, we illuminate. It's not a single star. It's we are an illumination of the night with the beauty of stars. You know, it's one thing to have some light at night, but what does God do to us? He gives us a light show every night. Have you ever been out in the desert where there's no light pollution at night and you see the stars? It's like Christmas decorations, you know, like nobody's ever done. And he's saying you, in a lovely way, in a joyful way, in a, in a poetic way, in a beautiful way, you stand out as lights in the world just by not doing this tiny little thing, murmuring and complaining. That every time your heart wants to murmur and complain, just say, Lord, thank you that you have all things in your hand. Thank you that there's nothing that happens to me that you don't know about and you're not concerned about. And if we'll do that, we shine as lights. We illuminate the, the world around us very, very brightly. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You know, he doesn't say some of you are going to shine every once in a while. The moment you believe God's spirit comes into our life, Jesus said, I am the light, but when I leave, you are the lights. We are by nature light. We are by nature salt. So we do shine as lights. Even on the worst, sinful, most disobedient day of your life, you still shine as lights. The question isn't whether we shine as light. The question is how bright of a light we shine. The Bible says also that your light shines before men. Light isn't revealing light to other lights. <laughs> light is revealing light to the darkness. And then he says that men would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So our good works, no matter how small, causes them to believe in God. And not only believe in God, but to begin to worship God. Isn't that amazing? Now, I, I thought about this. Back when I was a child, we lived in Central California. 
There was nobody home on Sunday mornings. Everybody went to church. There was nobody in our church, in, our, in, my, in my school, secular public school, that didn't go to church somewhere, that didn't believe in God some way. I mean, there were people that probably didn't believe in God, but it was very, very few. And there were a lot of people that, in, in one way or another, were trying to follow God. And if they weren't, there some weren't, but they were very, very few. So when you thought about going and knocking on doors in my little Central California farming community, saying, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus, they'd, 99% of the time, you're going, oh, yeah, I love the Lord with all my heart. I go to this church over there. I go to that. You know, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm in the choir here, whatever. And most of America was sort of like that. But now, not the case, is it? Now we're, we're like going into a communist country. And the youth of today, I mean, it happens when I go to witness, I mean, several times people say, I'm an atheist. About two minutes later, okay, I'm not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. Okay, let's work on that now. Um, but it's just amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing how many people you ask just simply, what do you know about Jesus? Nothing. Junior hires, high school or college age. I'm like, nothing? You've never heard that Christ died on a cross? No. Why, why would anybody die on a cross? That's horrible. This is what happens, guys. I'm not, Chuck, hey Chuck, Brother Chuck, is that true or not? I'm sorry, you were taking notes there. How often do you meet people who don't know anything about Jesus? A lot. A lot. I mean, it shocks you. And you, you first think they're sort of messing with you a little bit, and, but they're so sincere. Can, well, I can, can I tell you about what Jesus did for you? They are just, yeah. Yeah, somebody did something for me. I want to know about it. They're the one that's going to listen to you more. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of times you're trying to talk to somebody who left Christianity and they got so much baggage, you have to sit there and sort through item after item after item after item before they'll, they'll listen. But that, our world now is really in darkness. Our America is really in darkness. And you know what? There are far fewer lights in the midst of that darkness than ever before. That's the reality. Jesus, let me read it now. You're the light. You shine. Whether you like it or not, you're a believer. You shine. Little or a lot. And then people see God, believe in God, and then glorify God. In Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, it gives light to the whole house. Let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So there, he's saying the only, only way you could be a really dim light is if you consciously said, I don't want people to know I'm a Christian and see the light. So they put it under a bed or hide it under a basket. Even then, it's still giving light, but it's a dim light. And why do people do that? Because a lot of times we struggle as Christians, and we feel ashamed. And I don't want to be a bad example of Jesus, so I, I just rather them not know I'm a Christian at all, so I don't damage the name, uh, the reputation of Christ. Guys, understand, the world doesn't need perfect people. They're not going to get them even if they think they need them. People don't need to see people that aren't sinning perfect, perfectly or living a holy life perfectly. A matter of fact, if some guy walks down there in a robe and a white collar, they probably won't give him the time of day or whatever other religion. People aren't needing to see perfection. I'll tell you what, I, I've heard of testimonies where it's like, yeah, I had this guy next to me. And he was a, a Christian, and the guy fell and stumbled and got angry, and so many horrible. This guy was like the worst Christian example, but 
it's like he was never discouraged. He's just like, God saved me. I know God's got a hold of me, even though I'm struggling right now and, 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 and I'm falling and getting back up. I, I, I know that where my sin abounds, grace abounds more. And, and people were encouraged by that failure testimony. Going, man, if God's putting up with that guy, he can put up with me. Because that's what it's going to look like when I get saved. It, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with alcohol or I'm struggling with pornography or I struggle with anger or, or you know, I'm in the middle of a divorce or, or whatever it is. And, and, and this guy, he's, his life is more messed up than mine. And he knows that God's still loving on him and receiving him and walking with him. And, and if that's the case for him, that can be the case for me. You know, people that walk in here off the streets, they hear us sing, and they think all of you guys like have taken voice lessons. They're like, man, if you go to that church, you got to sing perfectly. Now, do we know better than that? They look at you guys at church going, oh my gosh, I think they just glide. I don't even think they leave a footprint. They're all so holy. And sometimes it causes them to say, man, I don't want to mess that place up. Everybody else is so perfect. I, I'll be the guy who is a big flat tire at that church. I... Now, guys, God didn't say, okay, if you're going to be a light of the world, number one, you got to cut this sin and stuff out. You can't be a light to even one person if you're sinning. So just stop it. This week, you determine not to sin. Be holy as God is holy. Do we got it? Yes, yes, I got it. I know, I try, I'm trying, I'm trying. I just, you know, I determined last week I wasn't going to sin, and by Monday at noon I did. God's not saying that, is he? He said, just follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Just come unto me, learn of me. And now, now he's saying, guys, just walk by faith and trust that God has everything in control in your life, right down to every hair on your head. He's had you in behind and he's had you in before. And if your next step takes you into hell, not the valley of the shadow of death, but deeper into hell, Psalms 139 says, I'll be with you. If the next step you take takes you to the top of the mountain, God says, I'll be there with you. I've hedged you in behind. I've hedged you in before. And you are going to go through trials and tribulations. And you are going to be tested. And you're going to see the sinfulness and the weakness of your flesh. This is why I had to die on the cross. But if you're willing, I'll empower you. The moment you take up that cross, I'll give you power to carry it. The moment you cry out and say, Lord, today I want to crucify my flesh with its passions and desires, I'll empower that in your life. Lord, today I, I want to live a life where I'm rejoicing always in everything giving thanks. This is your will. I'll empower that. I'll bring to mind faith and that I'm with you, and I love you. If you will be a believer in this area, trusting God by faith and not murmuring and complaining, you're going from just being a light to being a radical light in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation because they're full of complaint. If you're not a believer, this is your heaven. If you are a believer, this is our worst we're ever going to get it, right? You're living in a body that will never be as bad in heaven. You're living in a world that will never be this evil in heaven. It's, it's a difficult place for us as believers. But he's simply saying there, and then he says in verse 16, holding fast the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I may not run in vain or labor in vain. The word holding fast in the King James, it says holding forth. It can mean either way. So in other words, hang on tight, or it's saying present, hold forth the gospel, hold forth the word of God. This is what I believe 
is the correct, the correct way. Holding forth. Holding forth, and I rejoice that I did not labor. Paul says, man, when I come and you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ and you have lived in this life without murmuring and complaining, you've been lights of Jesus and brought life of Jesus to people and God's rewarding you for that. He said, oh, I'm going to have so much glory in God for that. Because, I mean, Paul's your teacher. If you do well on the test, it reflects on the teacher, doesn't it? But he makes it clear there. Hold fast or hold forth the word of life. We, we do understand, right, guys? There is no hope for anybody going to heaven without Jesus. He alone is the name in which men can be saved. He alone is the only way unto the Father. He alone is the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He alone is the resurrection and the what? Life. And so Paul says, cause me on that day when God is judging you to have great rejoicing and joy. So there is witnessing, but then there's being a witness. And you are already a witness by the fact that you believe in Christ. So it's not whether you're going to shine as light. It's how bright of a light you're going to shine. And yes, living sexually pure and without anger, without greed. I mean, those things are a given that we are striving to walk as Jesus walked. But in this text on sanctification, it's sort of blowing our mind. To say, look at how small of a little thing that can happen in your life would cause such an amount of fruitfulness. And that should concern us. Because there is no other way men are going to be saved. Jesus died on the cross because there is no other name. There is no other way. Until Jesus took our sins upon himself and punished for our sins, we could not have life. I want to close with these two passages in Mark 4, 18 to 19. Jesus said, now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They're the ones who hear the word of God, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And then the next one is 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake unto righteousness. Wake up. Do not sin. This is not talking about the sin of doing something bad. It's talking about the sin of not doing something when you should be doing something. The sin of omission. For some do not have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. There is no greater joy on this planet when you lead somebody to Christ. And uh, I've been in a case where we have this spinning thing down there, and we, they spin it. They ask, us, ask them questions. Do you know how to have eternal life? Or do you know what John 3.16 says or whatever? And, uh, and you'll have sometimes junior high, high school, teenage kids, and their mom, this happens so many times, their mom's right there and, and uh, going, are your kids going to be able to answer that? Mm, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I would like to know. And they're like, what's John 3.16? Like, what's that mean? Well, it's a verse in the Bible. Oh, yeah, I I don't know anything about the Bible. And I'll ask the mom, Mom, do you know what it is? Yep, she says it. How how is it your kids don't know that? Well, I was raised Catholic, or I was raised in a Christian church, but yeah, we don't go to church, and, you know, I figured they'll, they'll find their own way with the God thing. And then just look at her going, You are knowingly silent while your kids are going to hell. How how can any mother who loves your kids do that? You should have said the most important thing I could ever tell them was to have a spiritual life and to grow in that spiritual life and to mature in that spiritual life and to follow Jesus. 
So in the same way with us, your neighbors, the people you work with, your family, guys, let them persecute you. Let them throw you in prison. Let them hate you for Jesus' name's sake. But don't, don't do the foolish thing of taking the light and putting it under a basket so you're not offensive or, or they, everybody knows I'm not walking as a Christian to walk and I don't want them to think I'm a hypocrite or I don't want them to blame Christianity because of me. No, guys, take the basket off. Let the light stand. And I know you have faith in God to say, Lord, you got all things in your control. Whatever is going on, Lord, I trust in you. Amen? Lord, thank you for your word today. And Lord, as we just go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, we ask, Lord, that you would hide these things in our hearts. So often we've gotten so many religious ideas that are oppressive. So often we've gotten ideas that, that are just overwhelming, making us feel like we'll never be able to uh, achieve what other Christian men and Christian women have achieved. And we know it's just so untrue. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. <laughs> David was a man that stumbled and fell in so many different sins and ways. The men of God that you've chosen are often weak men in the flesh, but yet through the power of your spirit, because they have trusted in you, they have looked in, to you to honor you even in the midst of their weakness and their fleshliness and their struggles and their sin, you've done amazing things through their life. We thank you. We look unto you, Jesus, and for the mercies that will be revealed on that day. But we come to you right now, Lord. We want to lead our, be a light to our Jerusalem here. As we're heading into Easter, Lord, we ask that you would use all of us to be the light. And we know we don't live in a society like we did in the 60s where everybody went to church on Sunday and everybody knew about Jesus one way or another. And we live in a world today that have not, a whole generation and, or two or three even gone by that know nothing about you except you're a curse, a curse name they use. They definitely don't know that you love them, that you're longing for them that you desire to write their name in the book of life, that all they have to do is come unto you, believe in you, and they have eternal life. As many as receive you have eternal life or counted as children of God. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would help us to wake up to that reality, that we would stop sinning, not the sins of doing something wrong, but the sin of not being the light we should be. Lord, let us encourage one another why it's called day. If there's Christians that are coming to our minds right now that need encouragement, exhortation, even rebuke, Lord, put, give us the grace and the strength and the power of your spirit to exhort them why it's still called today. If there's any non-believers that are coming to our mind right now, and it may cost a friendship, it may make a neighbor uncomfortable with us, but Lord, help us to be the lights to the world that you've called us to be. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.